Great. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Our uh, first case is how to deal with rainbow glare and persistent higher order aberrations in a 2020 post LASIK patient by John Kanellopoulos. Good afternoon. We should do this in the evening and have a party uh, follow afterwards with uh, all these good friends. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I will be discussing um, about rainbow glare. My advice is don't get it. Uh, that's probably the best way to uh, how do I go move forward. I would meant in life in general. Okay. All right, thank you. So, um, so this is a gentleman um, still not going forward. Maybe somebody push. I'm Greek, so I'm not sure I'm good with this stuff. These are my, uh, okay, one slide more. I do consult for most of the stuff I'll be discussing, but nevertheless, this is a patient uh, uh, that uh, came to us in Athens. with means he flew his Gulfstream to the Athens International Airport and the history is that this young gentleman who's extremely bright very well educated had LASIK for the average myopia about minus four he had rainbow glare and he was treated I think in the UK by lifting the flap and lasering the back side of the flap in order to reduce rainbow glare and that is a technique that has been used out there the problem is that um, the good thing is that he remained having 2020 vision. So whoever did that did an excellent job. The problem is that he came to us with significant mesopic and scotopic symptoms. We like to document these objectively. You can see on the bottom right the contrasystivity because sometimes, actually most of the times, patients come in with symptoms. We're not sure they're always eye symptoms. Uh, we can see on the Seinfeld imaging on the top right that there's something funny going on with the total corneal power. Uh, and the anterior elevation, the two top maps. So there's some decentration there of the hand. On the bottom left, we see the epithelial maps and the placebo this uh, topography, which also reflects possibly either in the primary LASIK procedure or in lasering the backside of the flap, uh, some uh, shift in the apex area, I would call it, or the more curved area of the eye. Uh, to note here, the patient does not have ankle cap. So, we'll skip these questions since we're not gonna poll them. Uh, this is what went through my mind, and um, we have the ability, and I apologize for those of you who practice in the US, besides topography guided, to use ray tracing analysis. This is a new technology. Uh, good friends in the US have completed the FDA trial, so I think that this will be available in the US as well this year. Um, so, you're seeing here two platforms. On one on the uh, left, using ray tracing, which is a, a new technology that combines uh, sign fluke imaging, Hartman check, uh, uh, wavefront analysis, and uses the actual length of the eye, which is the middle of that picture, to create an avatar 3D model of each eye. So it's going away from the gold strand uh, model of the eye that all lasers and all uh, analyzers and customized treatments use. So you have a customized 3D eye, and then 2,000 rays are traced towards the uh, uh, anterior surface of the lens of the eye using the sample data. And then 2,000 rays from the retina to, uh, again, the anterior surface of the lens. And it can also, sorry for rushing, this is a lot of information, we've been working on this for five years. It can also calculate tilt between the cornea as a lenticular system and the lens as a lenticular system. This is very, very important. We've reported and worked a lot on that. Now, on the right-hand side, we're seeing something that is available in the US. We use it, I use it in New York office, using a topography-guided platform. And you can see right off the bat that the topographer will try and normalize that decentration that I uh, noted previously. It will do a hyperopic arc way nasally to elevate the area a little bit nasal to the center of the cornea, and then flatten a little bit that area that is um, seems to be decentered in the maps that we saw previously. 
two problems here. Number one, this guy is 2020. Doing antibiotic guided treatment, even I've done many of these, I wrote, I wrote 70 papers on using topo guided. I still cannot predict what the refraction of that patient will be post op this fix. And I'm sure he does not want his Gulfstream to be uh, parked in Athens for several months. So that's, that's an objective problem. Number two, how do you treat this patient? Do you relift the flap? We're using OCT data there and are studying carefully that the actual stromal thickness of the flap centrally, remember that flap was lifted, was lasered on its backside, and the rainbow glare successfully was gone, but so was gone most of the flap centrally. So the flap centrally is about 20 to 30 microns. I'm not sure I want to lift that flap. It kind of reminds me lifting a LASIK on an RK patient where you're kind of peeling off banana leaves. Um, in any case, so I decided to go transepithelial, uh, PRK with the ray tracing data. And of course, if I'm showing you this here, it means that the patient was happy. We had to, even in uh, Europe, where we have all the uh, bells and whistles, we had to treat the device because the uh, ray tracing uh, software will not treat transepithelially. It cannot use the Alcon Wavelight uh, Streamlight software. So we treated just half a doctor of astigmatism uh, with the Streamlight software to treat transepithelially. And you can choose the amount of epithelium to be removed. And obviously we took that from the epithelium map. And then the rest of the refraction meaning lower aberrations, which was minuscule, a little bit of hyperopia, a little bit of astigmatism, plus the higher aberrations, and the tilt, because it was tilt, I can tell you from the bottom picture between the cornea surface and the uh, lenticular surface. Um, so we did a two-card treatment, transepithelial with a little bit of astigmatism and the ray tracing. Um, and uh, the top picture now is pre-op and post-op, and we can see that the pentacam shows the total cornea power better centered and we turned that significant oblique coma into a little bit of a trifoil. Patient ended up uh, 16 over 10, that's a 20. Uh, 2012, I think, uh, improved consciousnessivity and um, he also took me on a tour with his jet. So uh, this is uh, us uh, working with technologies that's designed to treat uh, myopia, to get better outcomes with myopia, uh, off-label. So we have to be very careful with this to treat some of the refractive complications we encounter. Thanks so much for having me. John, I have a quick question. So the just just to understand it, so you, you said you used two cards with one just to go trans epithelial, you got through the epithelial, and then you added cylinder to treat so there's something to do. Yes, I, I took the refraction of the ray tracing um, uh, lower aberrations, so I think it was like a plus half minus 0.75. So I took that 0.75 cylinder of that refraction and added it to the trans epithelial, it's called streamlight in outcome terminology to go through the epithelium and then treat the residual refractive error, lower aberrations, and the higher aberrations through the ray tracing software. So I cheated once more. <laughs> yeah, we're excited. So we're excited to have that technology here. How long have you been using that, the ray tracing technology? Uh, November of 19. Oh, okay. So we've been using it for a long time. We have a multi-center uh, study that I monitored for Alcon uh, published last month. Uh, it's fantastic. The only pearl here, for those that most of you here are very familiar with uh, fixing eyes with uh, topography guided, is that the younger patients, they can still, by accommodating, trick a little bit the uh, wafer and aberrator. So uh, the, the, my go-to for everybody who's under 30 is to use the one drop of half uh, tropicamide, uh, half hour, so it's not cycloplegia, it's half hour of half percent tropicamide uh, measurements as the uh, what, what's best measurement. What's your age cut off for that? Who's I think 30. Okay. Yeah. You also look how they're dressed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm younger too. <laughs> Thank good, you so Good point, very good point. <laughs> Anybody else on the panel have a comment or question?
Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a great case. All right, so we're going to invite our next case, Dr. Catherine Hatch.